You can make an argument by analogy about anything, but Paley used it to talk about God in what's known as the watchmaker analogy. In a popular video about intelligent design, Crash Course aims to show that the famous watchmaker analogy from Paley is flawed. In this video, I will show you why all of his counter arguments fail. Welcome to the channel, my name is Kyle Lange and my goal is to help you see and defend the truth of Christianity. Crash Course thinks that Paley's argument is flawed, but what exactly is the watchmaker analogy? He asked us to imagine what we would think if we found a watch on the ground. Would we imagine that the watch simply appeared randomly, spontaneously on its own? Or would we see the complexity of it and notice that its parts seem to come together in a particular way in order to accomplish a goal? If so, wouldn't we think that the watch must have been made by someone on purpose? Paley was arguing that the teleology demonstrated by a watch would lead us to conclude that it was designed by an intelligent creator with a particular end in mind. After establishing the fact that the watch needs a watchmaker, Paley argued that living things such as humans are similar to watches in the sense that both of them are complex and serve a specific purpose. If watches and humans are in that sense similar enough, then the case could be made that humans too must be intelligently designed. And this is where Crash Course disagrees. He thinks the analogy is unjustified because human bodies and watches are too dissimilar. Some parts of nature seem to be without purpose. A blind spot obviously doesn't have any function, and neither do nipples on a man. Paley's response here was, just because you don't know there's a purpose doesn't mean there isn't one. But this is a problem too, because his whole argument for believing in God is that you should look at the world and see purpose. So if we see some things in the world that are working great, and really seem to have complexity and definite use, and others that don't, that's a flaw in his argument. What's more, the absence of any obvious purpose in things can lead people to start searching for purposes, effectively making them up. For instance, I could find a purpose for this finger, I could use it as a nose picker. It would make a good one, it's just the right size to really get in there and dig around, but was my finger designed to pick noses? Probably not. What Crash Course tells is that it's not helpful to simply subjectively attribute purpose to things. With the watch, everybody recognizes there's a clear purpose. But with biological organisms, this is not the case. Therefore, the analogy doesn't work. This is actually not a good counterargument against Paley's analogy. The only thing Crash Course showed is that we shouldn't just subjectively attribute purposes to things. I agree, but it doesn't follow that therefore there's no objective purpose to a human body. We can do the same silly thing with the watch. For example, you could use a watch for the purpose of hitting things. Or you could wear a watch just for aesthetic purposes. We all know that this is not the real reason why watches are made. They are made so people can easily know what time it is. But the question is, how would we know that this is the purpose of the watch if we didn't know beforehand it was created for that purpose? Well, if the watch was only created to hit things, then all the complex components were not necessary. We could only explain why the material was hard, but not all the specific complexities. In other words, this purpose is silly because it is unable to explain the whole thing. It can only explain a small part of it. And the same is true if the purpose of the watch is just to look nice. This purpose is subjective because it cannot explain all the invisible complexities on the inside. Therefore, if a particular purpose of a thing cannot explain the whole thing, then it's probably not its real purpose. Now it becomes clear why Crash Course nose picker example is stupid. The human finger is not just a nose picker, it's part of a human body. So we all know that this is just a silly subjective purpose of the finger. It is not a complete story. 20th century British philosopher Bertrand Russell made fun of this purpose-finding tendency by pointing out that you could look at a bunny and form the belief that God gave it a fuzzy white tail so hunters would have something to shoot at. The point is, if we're the ones inventing purposes rather than recognizing ones that are inherently there, then we're the real creators of purpose in the world, not God. Basically, if you believe that God made eyes for seeing, then you also have to believe that he designed fingers as nose pickers and rabbit tails as bullseyes and blind spots as ways for us to get into the car accidents. So the counter-argument here is we don't just get to pick and choose and say God designed the stuff we want him to have designed and not the other stuff. It is true that we don't get to pick and choose what the purposes of things are. To find out whether the purpose you attribute to a thing is subjective or objective, you have to find out whether the attributed purposes explain the whole thing instead of just part of it. The reason why we all intuitively recognize that a watch has an intelligent designer is because all the different complex components serve the same overarching purpose. This simply cannot happen by chance, because the odds are so astronomically low that all parts come together so neatly. 
In the book Undeniable, molecular biologist Douglas X calls this functional coherence. Functional coherence is the hierarchical arrangement of parts needed for anything to produce a high level function, each part contributing in a coordinated way to the whole. In other words, if the different components with different functions all serve the same overarching purpose, then there's functional coherence. So this is what I say is kind of the um, hallmark of what we would call an invention. It has this sort of structure to it. It is a top level thing that does something clever. And, and in order to do that clever thing, it has all kinds of things arranged within it in order for it to do that. So it's parts within parts. The top level thing is the thing that does the high level function. It has components within it, each of which has components all the way down to the elementary constituents. And this looks more um, sort of technical than it is. I mean, you're, if you take a text message and you send like a sentence um, in your phone, by your phone, you send a text to someone to tell them to meet you somewhere at a certain time or you'll be here, meet me here at this time. You've done this, you've invented something. You've arranged letters at the bottom level to make words and phrases and ultimately the whole content of that sentence. You've done exactly this. You've arranged things in a hierarchical order and each of those letters is there in order to make the right word, in order to make the right sentence, in order to convey the meaning, right? We clearly see this in a watch, but the question is whether living things also have it. If functional coherence exists in biological organisms, then Paley's analogy is reasonable. Crash Course didn't really give an argument as to why he thinks there is no functional coherence in organisms. He just gave examples of silly subjective purposes, but he didn't show that there's no overarching objective purpose to organisms. I think it's obvious that there is an objective biological purpose to living things. It's survival and passing on of genes. The heart, lungs, liver, brain and muscles all have a specific function in service to this overarching purpose. This makes it very similar to a watch. Even the bright bunny tail seems to have an objective purpose. It is not there so hunters can shoot at it, but to distract and confuse would-be predators. Researchers from Germany actually discovered this. This of course increases the chance that the bunny will survive. The same is true for human fingers. Fingers give us the advantage to grab things and use tools, which is beneficial to our survival. To reduce the purpose of the finger to a nose picker is silly because the finger is part of a human body and you have to look for functional coherence. So it seems that crash course is wrong. The components of watches and living things both exhibit functional coherence. Therefore, it is a good analogy. Next he argues that living things don't really need an intelligent designer because we now have a perfectly good natural explanation for the origin of living things. Paley says that bodies are purposeful and from there concludes that the purpose had to have been put there by an intelligent creator. But another explanation for how bodies came to have the complexity and functionality they have today is natural selection and random mutation. We can concede that the existence of a designer god helped make sense of the origins of the world in a pre-scientific age, but now we have a perfectly good scientific explanation for how the complexity of the world came about. So who needs a watchmaker when you have evolution by natural selection? If there's a reasonable natural explanation for the origin of living things, then I agree that we don't need to posit an intelligent designer. The problem with this point is that there isn't a reasonable natural explanation. The theory that natural selection working on random mutations can explain all the complexities of living things is called neo-Darwinism. There's no evidence that this mechanism is capable of producing all the information that is stored in DNA. As a matter of fact, there is strong evidence that it's impossible that a natural mechanism can account for all the information in the DNA. There are many subjects in biology that neo-Darwinism cannot account for, such as the origin for the first life, the Cambrian explosion, the irreducible complexity of the cell and the evolution of new functional proteins. Let me say something about functional proteins. Functional proteins are complex three-dimensional protein folds that are based on certain DNA sequences. These proteins perform a biological function that is beneficial for the organism. Protein folds are like essential building blocks for neo-Darwinian evolution. The formation of a new functional protein as a result of a mutation in the DNA is the least complex innovative change while still being significant in the sense that the organism could benefit from it. It is the minimal random change that is necessary for the mechanism to work. So in order for the neo-Darwinian mechanism to work, new functional proteins need to be formed as a result of random mutations. Now what is mind blowing is that functional proteins are extremely rare compared to non-functional proteins. X determined how rare these proteins actually are. 
His experiments reveal that for every DNA sequence that generates a short functional protein fold of only 150 amino acids in length, there are 10 to the power of 77 non-functional combinations. To get an idea of how large this number is, think about how many organisms have ever lived during the entire 3.5 billion year history of life on Earth. Approximately 10 to the power of 40 organisms have ever lived. You could say that every time an organism reproduces, there is a new mutation possibility. This is a large number, but only a small fraction of 10 to the power 77. According to X's research, it follows that the chance of evolving just a single functional protein in the entire history of life on Earth is approximately 10 to the power of minus 37, which is an astronomically low probability, especially when you consider that this seems to be the smallest random mutation to even start biological evolution. So to claim that neo-Darwinism can explain the complexities of living things is simply false. Finally, crash course argued that the theory of intelligent design is unreasonable because the designer seems to make a lot of mistakes. Another objection to Paley's case came from the 18th century Scottish philosopher David Hume, who pointed out that if we're to take the analogy seriously, we'd need to conclude that the creator that Paley posits seems to make a lot of mistakes. And not just blind spots, like how about hurricanes? Or why would he make bodies with certain tissues, like in the breast, prostate, or colon, that are so incredibly prone to cancer? Why would he make umbilical cords that could wrap around a baby's neck? Why would he make butterflies have to wait for hours immobile for their wings to dry as soon as they come out of their chrysalis, making them easy prey for predators. Hume pointed out that the world is chock full of stuff that looks cruel, ridiculous, impractical, and contrary to life. A flawed world, he said, implies a flawed creator. I don't really see what his point is. If this should be an argument against intelligent design, then it is terrible. First of all, what we see as a mistake could simply be the result of our ignorance. Maybe the examples he gave serve an important function, which we simply do not yet understand. Second, even if the designer made a flawed creation, that does not in the least prove that therefore living things aren't the result of intelligent design. Think about some old car, such as the Ford Pinto. Its blackened gas tank could explode when the car was rear-ended. It would be absurd to conclude that therefore this car was not designed. The same is true for living things. A flawed creation would raise questions for theologians as to why a perfect god would create an imperfect world. But it would not show that living things are not intelligently designed. Let's end this video with my favorite philosopher and apologist, William Lane Craig. In a debate with Christopher Hitchens, he responded to this point from Crash Course. We can concede that the existence of a designer god helped make sense of the origins of the world in a pre-scientific age, but now we have a perfectly good scientific explanation for how the complexity of the world came about. Barrow and Tipler, two physicists in their book The Anthropic Cosmological Principle, list ten steps in the course of human evolution each of which is so improbable that before it would occur, the sun would have ceased to be a main sequence star and incinerated the earth. And they calculate the probability of the evolution of the human genome between, to be somewhere between four to the negative 180th power to the 110,000th power and four to the negative 360th power to the 110,000th power. So if evolution did occur on this planet, it was literally a miracle and therefore evidence for the existence of God.